sweet presence of the Lord is here. Hallelujah. Let's praise Him together. I want God's way to be my way. I want God's way to be my way as I travel here below. For there is no other highway that a child of God should go. of God's people. And we're being in the house of the Lord tonight. And I appreciate the faithfulness of God being here, don't you? His presence is just like heaven, isn't it? Amen.
We heard some good preaching on the weekend, didn't we? The students, amazing. Hallelujah. We're going to have quite a lineup of great little preachers the next little while helping us out. So we're in the book of Malachi, and uh, I guess we're okay, are we? We don't have that song in our system. Uh, <laughs> all right, I, I wanted, that's an old one. I learned that one from Jack Long, I think, when I assisted him in McAdam. Wow, like 100 years ago. Actually, uh, would that be four, 39 years ago? I can't be that old. I just can't be that old. Wow, 39 years ago. Can't believe I've even lived 39 years. Well, I'll tell you what, I've been over a lot of mountains and through a lot of valleys, and I would not trade one moment serving Jesus with any other life in this world. This is the absolute best life. I can honestly, sincerely say, as I look to the future, I'm not afraid. I'm excited. I'm excited. The world is petrified. The world is confused. The world is bewildered. They don't have a whole lot of sense of hope, and especially in a lot of places. But we do as Christians because we've got the gospel. Amen. And this is all just unfolding like Jesus said it would. It's helping me to believe his word even more. He's got a pretty good track record for accuracy. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we talked in, in the last little while um, out of the book of Malachi about some objections to surrender. And we sang about surrender tonight. I want God's way to be my way. And um, this was the last book written in the Old Testament. It was written by the prophet Malachi. I don't believe for a moment that he was the last prophet because the Bible says God won't do anything in this world except that he will announce it first by his prophets. God will speak through his prophets, through his men, through his women. God will speak and he will give us the directions that we need to be prepared. And so really the book of Malachi is a book about preparation. And it talks about um, the prophet coming right before Christ's coming, first coming. And that is Elijah. And uh, he came and he prepared the way in the person of John the Baptist. And the Bible also tells us that uh, this same kind of Elijah, hallelujah, this Elijah anointing, this Elijah prophetic anointing and ministry will occur again right before Jesus' second coming. And the ministry of Elijah was to restore all things. Bring, it, bring us back. Hallelujah. Amen. God's not going to let this church go out of the world with any less glory or power or demonstration than it had in the beginning at his birth. It's going to be greater. I really believe that Jesus saves the best wine to the last. Amen. He was say, he was making a statement. You know, wine is a, is a type of the spirit of God. And Jesus at the wedding of Cana, the first miracle that he performed in his earthly ministry, that at least is recorded, was turning the water into wine. And he saved the best to the last. Amen. And he's doing that. Amen. God is doing that. The greatest. Uh, so God's not just restoring the church back to where we were. God's taking us to a whole new level. But the word restore, uh, Jesus said Elijah would come first and restore all things. They didn't even recognize him in the person of John the Baptist. The disciples, after he explained it to them, they, the Bible says they understood that he was talking to John the Baptist. But before that, at the time, they didn't really uh, realize. And even John might not have realized that he was, you know, coming in the anointing of Elijah because they said to him, are you that prophet? Are you, are you the Elijah? He said, no, I am not. And he was really speaking the truth because he wasn't. He was John the Baptist. But the power and spirit of Elijah was upon him. And uh, he was there to restore all things, to bring things back to where it needed to be. A restoration ministry. So look up the definition of restore, and it means to reconstitute in health, in home, or organization. And reconstitute means to build up again from the parts, to reconstruct. And how many know that sometimes God has to deconstruct before he reconstructs? <laughs> sometimes God has to bring everything right down to the foundation and rebuild it from the foundation up. And that's all right. I feel like God has taken us apart. 
different times. But now he's putting us back together. Praise God. And uh, it's going to be in the way that God wants it to be. And I don't think hardly any of us can predict exactly what that's going to be. But we just know it's going to be great. And God's going to have his way. And, uh, you know, the angel told Zacharias that John would go in the spirit and power of Elijah. And he would work with three things. Uh, relationships. He said he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. So God's going to put uh, fathers in place. Spiritual fathers. I just claim that for your home. Amen? Claim that for your home. Spiritual fathers. God's going to raise up uh, fathers. And he's going to work on relationships between them and their children. Amen? So relationships are one of the number one thing that needs to be restored. And then uh, he also told us that he would deal with us on, on rebellion. And we'll get into the scripture a little later on. But rebellion would be to, to make it the people obedient, the obedience of the just. So he's going to deal with relationships, rebellion, and then the readiness of God's people to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. Oh, isn't that exciting? And I said one of the best ways to get prepared is to get hungry. To get hungry for the Lord. There's a difference between curiosity and hunger. God, God uses our curiosity to hook us, but he uses our hunger to fill us. Amen? Hallelujah. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall be filled. Those that are, those that are hungry and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. And blessed are the poor in spirit. Those that feel their need. Oh God, let us feel Feel our need so that you can fill our need. Amen? Hallelujah. So we can humble ourselves before the Lord and get holy before Him. He's going to restore us and He's going to do some great things. So the first objection we looked at, an objection to surrender is, God doesn't love me. God said, I love you. And then they said, where and hast thou loved us? He said, I loved you. He said, you were the underdog, Jacob. You were the one that, you were second in line. You weren't, in, you weren't even in the position to be blessed. But I blessed you, and I put you in first place. Amen? How many know that's what God has done with our lives? He has. We are, we are number one to God. I want to tell you something. You say, oh, I'm not number one. God is. Well, to God, you're number one. He puts his bride number one. Amen? He said, I'll make you the head and not the tail. He said, I'll bless you and I'll, I'll, I'll make you a blessing. He said, in blessing, I will bless thee. What did he mean? He meant it to be exponential. If you bless something that's already blessed, then it's a multiplication of blessing. Amen? How many want to just live under the blessing of the Lord? I believe we are. Hallelujah. Praise God. So God says, I love you. I love you. But they were, they were in denial of that. Amen. And then the second thing we talked about, of course, a little bit later on in the chapter, just scrolling through my notes, give me a little review. Um, God dealt with them over um, giving him the leftovers and not their best. And he said, you really, he said, you, you wouldn't treat your governor like this. He said, you bring, you bring the, the lamb that's blemished, he's blind, he's got a broken leg, and, and you give that, and you think, well, it won't matter, he's just going to God. And God says, what? Wait a minute. You wouldn't do that for the governor. You need to treat me better than anybody else. And we talked about that. Loving God so much that in comparison, all other loves pale when you put them up beside it. We need to love God. Amen. God is really interested that we love him. The Bible says, if any man not love not the Lord Jesus, let him be anathema. That's what Paul said. Paul, Paul had his fill of, of people being haphazard about serving God and being lukewarm. He said, if you don't love Jesus, be accursed. If you can't love this, this, this Jesus Christ who's given his life and, and, and such an altogether lovely individual as Jesus, just perfect and loving and kind and patient and just so wonderful. He, he said, if you can't love him, uh, he said, you're the curse, the anathema of God is going to be on you. Amen. I'll tell you what, the world walks away from the cross. You can only face one thing, and that is the judgment that, that Jesus died on the cross to take for us. It's, it's, I, it's, I tell you, today, our, our civilization here in North America is so warped. Our value system, it's just gone right, through, right, right to the basement. 
but I'm thankful for a church that values what God has given to us. Amen. We value the things of God. We love Jesus. You know, even, even after Peter's failure, Jesus didn't spend a whole lot of time addressing the failure. He alluded to it by asking Peter three times. But the real thing that Jesus was interested in was, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than everything else? And he said, Lord, yes, I do. Finally, after the third question, Peter was grieved. <laughs> let's not be grieved with the Lord, amen? He's trying to make a point to us. Hallelujah. Let's, let's allow the conviction of the Word of God and the Spirit of God every once in a while just to stick a darning needle into our heart, amen? I want to be pricked by the Spirit of God, amen? Every once in a while, I just want to be challenged to be more for God, just to go a little further. Peter was grieved with the Lord. He said, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, all right, then prove it. Prove it. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed, feed my rams. So prove it. Amen. So um, show me that you love me and, and glorify my name. And in verse 14 of chapter 1, he said, for I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts. God's not on an ego trip. He's just making a fact. He's just making a statement of fact. I'm a great king. Say the Lord of hosts, everybody agrees with that. He's the great king. He's the king of the universe. That's pretty great. So he said, if you will give to your governor what you, you what you would give, then what you vow to God and sacrifice, make sure it's something that costs you. Amen. Make sure it costs you to serve the Lord. Amen. Make sure it costs you to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Because it costs him everything to bring us into this wonderful family. Uh, let's look at chapter two and verse two. We'll start with verse 1. And now, O priests, ye priests, this commandment is for you. Verse 2. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yeah, I have cursed them already because you do not lay it to heart. Now, the first person that God's going to deal with in this congregation it's not going to be you. It's going to be me. God's going to deal with me. And as I surrender to him, he will move me into the place where I need to be with him. So that he can do what he already wanted to do all along. That will be the first thing that will happen. I'm so tempted to read to you something Brother Calhoun shared with me about a preacher in Tennessee. I think it was Nashville. Where he was, he was complaining to the Lord in prayer about uh, the, the the team that he worked with, the team of leadership in the church, and uh, he complained about this and that in the church, and this is the problem that he was bringing before the Lord. And one day God spoke to him, and this was over COVID, over this season. God spoke to him, and he said that they're not the problem. He said, "You're the problem. You're the problem." And God began to deal with him on pride. God began to deal with him on, on his lack of prayerfulness and uh, began to move upon him to pray by the hours. Well, within the last, uh, I think in the last year, they had baptized 250 people. But in the last three months, they have baptized a thousand people. And he said, it's not something that they're organizing. It's not something that they planned or it's not like a, a drive. That It's just the working of God. Just people coming to God. And, uh, and just in a service, I want to be baptized. I want to, I want to be right with God. And they have baptized a thousand. And he began to realize that God's got to start with the ministry. Pray for your pastor. Amen. Pray that I'll be wide awake. Pray that I'll be sensitive. Pray that I'll be obedient. Pray that I will be surrendered. Pray surrender into my life. Amen. You say, well, you need to do that yourself. I know I do. But I'm just saying that like, that's a good prayer to pray for leaders, that they would be surrendered. Pray that I would be focused. Would you pray that? There's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of things that can get us looking other 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 places. But I want to be focused. I believe that spiritual power comes when we are focused. Amen. The Bible says that Peter, he looked upon the lame man. He perceived he had faith to be healed. And the Bible says he fastened his eyes on him. There's something about focus that brings us into a place where we can be receptive to the power of God, to the directions of God. Amen. You know what? In this room right now is all kinds of, 
of radio and television and cell phone messages are going through this air right now. You cannot even perceive them, but they are electronically received. Now the Bible says that carnal man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, the natural man, for they are spiritually understood. Discerned. He's spiritually discerned. Spiritually understood. They are spiritually grasped. They are spiritually uh, received. And so you and I need to pray for the body of Christ and for the leadership of the body of Christ that we would be tuned in and be sensitive to the voice of God. Because all the power, all the victory, all the direction that we need, it comes by being tuned in. And so we pray, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, for every spiritual leader in this area, every spiritual leader within our precious district, that every heart would be tuned to you, that every, every life would be given to prayer and to the ministry of the word, to sharing the truth with the lost. And just meditating upon the Lord and receiving from God. And that we will be obedient. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And let's continue to pray. Because if not, then the very things that were blessings can become curses to us. Amen? They can be part of the distraction. And of course he goes into more detail on that. But um, verse 13, we're going to jump down there. And this have you done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore, or receiveth it with goodwill at your hands. So they were they were weeping over the altar, saying, God's not really listening to us. God's not paying attention. Why does God not pay attention? Why does God sometimes not pay attention? Jacob, have I loved Esau? Have I... Hey, have I disregarded? Why does God sometimes not pay attention? Wherefore, he said, verse 14, because the Lord, and this might surprise you, hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. God says right here, I don't pay attention to people who don't pay attention to their relationships. God said, you are not regarding the wife of your youth. She's thy companion and the wife of thy covenant, thy marriage covenant. In other words, God says that it's very important, the relationships that we have with one another, especially our spouses if we're married. If not, then just in general, everybody, and this applies to us all, our relationship with one another affects God's ability or His willingness, I should say, to listen to us. You know, Paul talks about fasting and praying. And, and he says that to married couples, he said, don't defraud one another. He said, accept it be for a period of time. And uh, what he said is, don't, don't ignore each other. And that means in every area. He said, don't ignore each other. Except, he said, if by consent, you are giving yourself to prayer and fasting. And you're wanting just to pull away and have some time where you're just going to really focus in on God and get closer to God. Those times are important. They are necessary. But he said, make sure that you're in agreement so that the other person does not feel neglected. Now, it might surprise you that God looks at us and our relationships with others very seriously. Now, you, you're not responsible for, the, for how other people are. If they're not serving the Lord, you can pray for them. You can love them. You can do your best. Listen, I'm not telling you that 100% of the responsibility is on your shoulders. No way would I put that burden of guilt or um, responsibility upon a saint of God, especially when they're doing their best to honor the Lord. And some of you serving God on your own, I just say, God bless you. Uh, be faithful to God. It will pay off. My brother-in-law said uh, to my sister, he said, uh, he said, you know what? And he said to this, the pastor and the others that were there when he was, uh, that night he prayed through the Holy Ghost. Uh, they had that little prayer meeting. He said, you know what? If it hadn't been for the fact that my wife had faithfully served God, I would never be here today. Her faithfulness. So be faithful. There was a lot of lonely weeks, months, years, <laughs> years, decades. You know, she served God alone, but she was faithful to God. 
And he watched that, and he and you know something? There were a few times when she got discouraged, and he was almost like afraid. You know, aren't you going to church? Type of thing, because he really wanted her. He knew that she was holding on to Jesus, and and he was the lifeline. Amen. He really knew that. He might not have been ready to make the commitment, but I'm so thankful he has now. Amen. And it is important. The Bible says uh, that we are we are to pray. For a sanctified covering over our spouses if they're not serving the Lord. And we can do the same thing over our children. We can pray a covering. Because the Bible says that your children are holy unto the Lord. That means they're set apart for special treatment. God will deal with your kids. Amen. God will speak to your kids. Amen. How many know we're seeing it? I mean, keep believing God with me. We're going to believe God with We're banding together. And the devil does not know what to do with that. This is a new thing that we've been so open. And, and you folks uh, have needs. We know the needs that are there. We're lifting up. There's five or six young people that we're praying for right now. And then we've got some others that were here back before COVID. And, you know, they've grown up. We need to pray them back into the, into, into a place of relationship with God. Amen. You need to reach out to them. You got Facebook music. So I miss you. I remember you guys worshiping the Lord, how you were so plugged in. And I remember when you got baptized. I remember how thrilled the church was. I remember the peace that come all over you. Just, hey, you push whatever buttons you can. Amen. Amen. I believe pull whatever strings you can. Use whatever. <laughs> Hallelujah. Use it. Amen. But relationships are so important. You see, I believe that our relationships with one another will really determine a lot whether and, and, and the degree of revival that God gives to us. Amen? Because we are, we are the fabric of the church. And if there's a strong network, if we are bonded together, if we are one, if we love one another, we will defend one another. If we stick together, we provide a, a, a fabric that's a safety net for those new ones that come in. And when they have a fall, well... They don't fall through the cracks. It's like a trampoline. You fall. He just sends you the other direction. Amen. We, 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 we capture them and just lift them up before the Lord. Amen. But there's got to be that unity. Say, well, why are you preaching that? Do you think there's a lack? No, I don't. I think we, it's wonderful, but it's never going to be taken for granted in this church. I'm never going to take it for granted in my ministry. There was a brother, Tekla Marion, had seen tremendous revival in Ethiopia. And he says, you know what? We don't pray for revival in Ethiopia. He said, we pray for unity. He said, over in North America, you guys pray for revival, revival, revival. He said, we just pray for unity and God sends revival. I think they've got it right. I think we, we maybe we're a little off track. Amen. God bless us with unity. Jesus said in John 17, he said, but if we would be one, that God's glory would be manifest in our midst. Amen. Hallelujah, I want to see God's glory. So he said, take heed to your spirit. You know, how do you, how we treat one another? And he said, um, for the Lord, the God of Israel, verse 16, saith that he hateth putting away. God says, I hate divorce. I know that there are people that are divorced, remarried, and God bless them, they're serving God. Um, I believe that there are some, there are some times when really, that's just the way it had to be. And you cannot go back and you cannot rechange, you can't change it. What God is addressing here is a casual attitude towards something that grieves his heart. You know, I don't care who you are. If you maybe, maybe if you've gone through it, like uh, you're, you're very thankful that it's behind you and that, you know, you're not in that relationship. And you may be, but you know, it's still hard. It's still hard to go through. It's very, very difficult. And God knows the, the, the pain it causes. It causes kids. Everybody's affected. In-laws are affected. It just really, it, it tears a family apart. And so I'm not here to put any guilt or uh, suffering on anybody because it's a fact today, you know, that there are so many in the world. I'd say the majority, uh, probably a good 50% of kids in school are growing up in homes where, where, where there's been divorce. And so we need to be very, very tender. But God's addressing you and I. He's just saying that, you know, I hate the putting away. God values uh, unity. God, listen, God will bless you for working on your relationship. Amen. That's what he's saying. Don't, don't, don't look at this as a way out. Um, I, you, can, you can actually get closer to God. I know this man. This man I, I know fairly well. And when he was, when he gave his heart to God, his wife did not want to serve God. She did not want to serve God. No way. And I, I think I can say this publicly because I won't say the community where it was, but 
you know, she, she was with other men in that community and he would lie on his face and cry and soak the carpet in front of the church. He would pray and pray and pray and she'd be out there driving up and down the street, you know, in the with the, another man's arm around her, you know, snuggled right up, right, right, right in the right in the right in the town. But he just kept on praying. He could have just said, "Well, that's," but he didn't give up. He just kept on praying. And you know what? God saved her. God saved her. I'm telling you, it's a miracle. Uh, they went into ministry. I mean, God, God turned that around. So God will bless you. If you do, now I would never encourage anybody in a relationship that was abusive or if there was anything that was that was taking place that was harming children to stay in that relationship. God does not want you to live in a pig pen. Amen. As far as I'm concerned, when somebody steps out, they are, they are breaking the marriage. They, they destroyed the marriage because these twain shall be one flesh too. And he that is joined to a harlot is one flesh. So if somebody steps out, then they're, they're joined to that other person. They have broken the marriage relationship. And technically, the person that um, provided that they were this, you know, doing their best to be the kind of husband or wife that they should be, that person is, is free. They're free to remarry from the scriptures. That's what the scripture teaches. Now, you may have a different opinion on that, and God bless you if you do, but from what I understand in the Scripture, in the Old Testament, if you committed adultery, they took you out and they stoned you. And that put an end to the marriage. Death to your part, you get it? Now, of course, we're not allowed to stone people in the New Testament, and I'm sure you may have felt like it at times, but, <laughs> but really, it is the death of a relationship. Now, you say, does that mean that people have to go their separate way? No. Not necessarily because you want that person saved. You want to have them restored. You want to restore the family. You do everything within your power. But if it's if it's beyond the scope of your ability and, and with God's help to see that restored, then you may have to just say bye bye. You know, have a good life. I'm not I'm not going to be tied to that mess. If you want that mess? You can have it. But I'm, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to honor God. Anyway, so. Just want to give a little balance to that thing. God hates divorce, but that does not mean that every time there's a divorce um, that, that um, you can't be right with God or you can't serve the Lord or you can't have that, that second marriage blessed of God. Because I do believe that there are exceptions. There are exceptions in the scripture. All right, now for many, many years, we didn't want to deal with the subject. I was pretty convinced probably for the last 30 years as I studied the scriptures, what the scriptures taught, but I um, didn't dare preach it. I'm going to preach it now. Because once you hit 50, you just don't care what people think. <laughs> you can say what you think. And I'm going to preach the word of God, and I, I'll, I've got my ducks in a row, got the scriptures lined up. Amen. But God wants to bless the marriages. God wants to bless the homes. And God wants to bless us with the right spirit and attitude towards our spouses. Because the Bible says that if the relationship is not right, that God, our prayers can be hindered. Amen. Now you can't be right for them, for the other party, but you can be right for yourself, right? Everybody say right. Because right. it's the truth. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. The third objection that they had, other than not pay, God not paying attention, God says you pay attention to your relationships, I'll pay attention to you. I'll forgive you as you forgive. Amen. It's, I'm telling you, the cross is a horizontal as well as a vertical. Amen. True Christianity, oh, I don't know. Maybe somebody online needs this, but I know you folks are perfect here. <laughs> True Christianity affects how we treat other people. Amen. <laughs> Say, that's good preaching, brother. All right. Verse 17. They said, we haven't worn out God's patience. Ye have worried, wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? We haven't wearied God. We haven't worn God out. And he said, when ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And he delighteth in them. Oh, where is the God of judgment? God's not going to judge. And that, that, oh, well, that's not what the Bible meant. The Bible doesn't mean that. Listen, the Bible means what it says. The Bible means what it says. And God's principles have not 
changed. Amen? God's principles have not changed. And the Bible says, Woe to him that calleth evil good or good evil. That's the world we're living in today. Our world is under a spirit of confusion. That's why everything's a mess. It's because confused thinking leads to a confused world. The Word of God will straighten out. There's nothing more common sense than the Word of God. The Bible says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That makes common sense. And God wants us as preachers of the gospel to declare, and as saints of God, to declare, thus saith the Lord. We're not to be afraid of what the common uh, opinion, the public opinion is today. Now I'm not going to get up. There's some things I'm not going to. I'm not going to get up and make a hobby horse out of it, because you need to use wisdom as well, right? Because we are we're involved in media. We we preach the word, but there's some some people can be very very foolish in how they declare the word of God and set themselves up for a lot of problems. We're just going to love people. We're going to see God deliver them from sin. We're going to see that God turn them around. We're going to stand for the truth. We're going to stand for holiness. We're going to stand for righteousness. We're going to stand for what thus saith the Lord. And we're not going to compromise. We're not going to back down. And God's going to change lives. We're in the healing, loving, restore, restoration business. Amen. God's restoring people's lives. And if you don't have a plumb line, if you don't have a standard to go to measure by, you won't know if you're right. You won't know if you're whole. But the Word of God declares to us what spiritual health is, what spiritual uh, holiness is. If the Word of God is the only standard that we can go by. Amen? Amen. I heard a preacher say one time, you know, it depends on where you are in the world. Well, how short is short and how long is long? Let me tell you something. <laughs> I believe in modesty. And I believe that we should cover our bodies. Amen. Now you don't like, need to look like you were off a little house in the prairie to be holy. <laughs> you can be classy and holy. Amen. I think you all look wonderful. We teach them at the Bible college, and I'm not ashamed to say this, that their skirt or dress should cover the knee when they're standing or when they're sitting. The Bible declares that God was speaking about his people and he said that they were going to be led away captivity and, and into captivity and that they were going to be they were going to be abused and misused and he said they were going to be stripped naked. He said and, and, and one of the things he said was was make you naked and, and reveal the revealing of the thigh. The thigh is from the knee to the hip. The hip to the knee is to be covered. That's what the Bible says. In fact, God said that the priests, they wore robes back in the day, but they would go uh, in the altars and work around the holy different places. And sometimes there were, there were, you know, there was activities that they were involved in that they could perhaps have been uh, exposed. So he said they were to wear breeches underneath those robes so that if they were doing any activities in their priestly ministerial role that they were to be modest at all times. Amen? Amen. And it is the will of God for people to be covered and it's the will of God for people to be covered up here as well. Amen? Hallelujah. I don't mind saying it. It's the truth. Hallelujah. You need to look in the mirror before you go out somewhere. Amen? Amen? Sometimes when I gain a little bit of weight, I check my pants out and see. <laughs> Broadening my horizon. Expanding my ministry. You know what I mean? Ten pounds. Something that was modest ten pounds ago might not be modest today. It's not just for women. This is, not, this is for men. Amen. I believe a woman should stand in front of a mirror and bend, bend down and tie her shoes. Make sure everything looks right. Amen. Amen. Well, except you see it. It's not my place to address them. If you see something, then, well, maybe you have a relationship with them. You can, you can tell them. Amen? You need to be modest. That's important, right? Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
We're living in a day of very, very tight clothing. I mean, you can wear a dress and a skirt. You can be immodest. You can wear... Everything is tailored, really tailored today. How do we get onto that? All right. Uh, you know, I've been here four and a half years. I've got to get on the clothesline once. And hang myself, right? It's common sense, isn't it? Clothing is meant to conceal, not to reveal. Clothing is meant to protect, not to project. All right. Hallelujah. So, wherein have we wearied him? When you say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he that delighteth in them, well, where is the God of Jehovah? Listen, I want to err, if I'm going to err, anyway, I'm going to, I want to err on the side of caution. I'd rather go a little too far than not far enough with the Lord. Amen. Verse 3, chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. He shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. You know, a lot of the world in Jesus' day was not prepared. That's why the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians and the Essenes, a lot of the different, there was about four major groups of Judaism. Few of them recognized Jesus. They didn't hear he's God in the flesh. The word made flesh. Fulfilling all the prophecies. Give me sight to the blind. Making the lame to leap like the heart. <laughs> Preaching the gospel to the poor. Jesus fulfilling every prophecy. Fitting the bill. And yet they didn't recognize him. Because they weren't prepared. But John did his job. He, he prepared the way. And yet it seemed like boom. All of a sudden he was there. And I hope that when God moves magnificently as he will that we can be prepared I hope that we can be prepared so that we can take advantage of what God is doing and make the most of it amen that we can make the most of what God is doing that we can be prepared that we can be ready because he comes suddenly you just faithfully serving God day after day week after week and then all of a sudden something happens and a church breaks out into revival and harvest. It just starts happening. And you've got to be, you, it's, it seems sudden, but really God's been planning for quite a long time to do it. But to us, it's like suddenly. And, and, the, and, the, and the key to God moving is that we would be ready for him and that we would be able to see a maintenance of what God has started. See it maintained. Because every church has had a revival and then lost it. And it's been back and forth, back and forth. I don't think we can afford to waste time between now and the coming of the Lord. We need to capitalize on every moment, every second. We need to hold on to what God is going to do. Amen? I really feel like faith, God is lifting faith up. I, I feel like this, this month as we are giving ourselves to prayer and to fasting, wave your hand and seeking God. If you could spend a half hour a day in prayer for revival, please, 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 please pray. Let's pray. Let's prepare ourselves because when it comes, we need to be able to be spiritual people that will know how to keep throwing some fuel on the fire. And to learn not to be distracted when the enemy, you know, comes out of the flames and latches hold on somebody. When the old serpent that we will... Not come to false conclusions about things like the people did. Paul just shook that off in the fire. You know the story. I don't have to go into all that. But the enemy will try to come out from hiding. and he will. Maybe that's a good thing. Because when he's hiding, we don't know where he is. But when he comes out. But God said, verse 2, Who may abide the day of his coming? Well, who shall stand when he appears. And we always think in terms of the, the coming of the Lord, the second coming, but I'm really much more interested in his coming and revival. Uh, because once he comes back the second time, that's it. There's no more time. I, I'm interested in, in his appearing in his glory. He said, he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. A fuller would be one who bleaches. So he's like a refiner's fire, like fire can purify anything. 
It can kill germs. Germs cannot live. Contamination cannot live in the fire. And the soap has the ability. You know, the soap can deal with COVID. If soap comes in contact with COVID. It, it just breaks it down. It loses its power to be able to attach to the cells in your body. When it comes, if it gets on your hands and you wash or sanitize, that, that soap, it breaks it down. Soap is, a, I didn't realize soap was so powerful. I know you should wash your hands, but. <laughs> he said, God's going to come like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of the silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. As I said, the ministry, God's going to really zing into the ministry. He's going to zero in on us. God wants us to a whole new level of dedication and sanctification. Now he said he'll sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. The, the refiner sits there and he turns the heat up and he watches as the silver becomes molten silver. He's watching. Why is he watching? Because he doesn't want to destroy what he's doing. He wants to make it more beautiful. But there's always contaminants in silver and gold. Amen. There's always a mixture of other things. And what happens is they turn up the fire. The impurities come to the surface. They skim them off. And what is the refiner sitting there and looking at the silver? What's he looking for? He's looking to see his reflection. And when that is pure, when all of that dross, which bubbles up to the top, he skims it up. He looks in that silver and he can see his reflection. How many know that's what God's looking for when he looks at us? Amen. And he said, he will purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. Verse five, and I will come near to you in judgment and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, that's witchcraft. And against the adulterers. And against the false swearers, that is liars. And those that oppress the hireling and his wages. Those that are unfair in their treatment of others. The widow, the fatherless, that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Basically, anything that is anti-relationship. God said, I'm going to deal with that. For I am the Lord, I change not. God's expectations have never changed. He said, therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. God is dealing with the church. But they said, well, where do we need to change? Where do we need to change, God? Even from the days of your fathers, verse 7, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me. I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you say, where and shall we return? What do we, what do we, how, in what way do we need to come? Listen, the church needs to come back to prayer. The church needs to come back to sacrifice. The church needs to come back to separation. The church needs to come back to holiness. The church needs to come back to dedication. The church needs to come back to fervent worship. Amen? Hallelujah. Another question. Another objection they made to full surrender. Verse 8, he said, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, Where and have we robbed thee? How have we robbed you, God? We haven't robbed. I haven't robbed you, God. And God answers, he said, In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, I believe that our saints here have been very, very faithful in this area. I believe that. And I thank God for the commitment that you have towards God's kingdom. And I am as excited to give to God's kingdom financially as I am to pray or do anything. Because you know what? We can try to pray and worship, do all the other things. But if we don't give, this, this thing's not going to go apart from finance. Amen? Everything in God's kingdom, everything in the world is tied into finance. Jesus said that if, if you can't be trusted with finance, you can't be trusted with spiritual riches. In other words, if I wasn't faithful to God in this area, God says, I don't deserve to preach the word or to pastor people. 
I have to be faithful in these areas uh, in order to be blessed of God, in order to be that leader that God wants me to be. He said, if we are not faithful, he said, ye are cursed with a curse for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. That's, that was the shape that they were in. It's no wonder he talked about restoration and getting to tear it down to the, to the bottom and rebuilding everything because they were. He said, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. That the needs would be met in the kingdom of God. He said, and prove me now herewith. Prove me. I want you to, I want you to prove me and watch, see what happens saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. How many of you would lift your hand and say, I have proven in my life that when you honor God, God honors you. That when you bless God's kingdom, you will never go without. Amen? Amen. It is a fact when we are faithful that God pours out. He said, I will pour out a blessing upon you that there will not be room enough to receive it. And part of that blessing is revival. It's not just that God pours out uh, financially and blesses us in our individual lives, but God blesses us emotionally, domestically. God blesses us spiritually. God blesses us with health. Amen. Health, uh, healing, and divine health. Amen. I believe that all comes because he opens up the windows of heaven and he pours out a blessing. And I love verse 11. He said, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. I will rebuke. I will rebuke the devil. I will rebuke those forces that would try to come against my kingdom and against my saints, against my people. I will stand up as a rebuke against them. I will fight your battles, God said. And it said, the, the devourer shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, before it's ripened, it's not going to fall and then be no good. He said, I, I will make sure that everything that you are in touch with will be blessed. He said, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. And then the, I guess it would be the, the fifth or the sixth, maybe. I'm not keeping count. Maybe you are. <laughs> we are not against you, God. This was another objection to surrender. Uh, your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? What have we said that's offended you? And in verse 14, he said, you have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? How many, have you, have you ever said that, you know, I've been serving God all these years faithfully? You know, what good, what good is it? Maybe, maybe some point in your life when you weren't so smart spiritually, you thought, <laughs> what's the benefit in this? But I want to tell you something. When you're walking in the spirit, the blessing of the Lord is you just see it all around. Amen. God's blessing. But this is where they were. They said, is it really to our benefit to serve God? That's where they were. He said, we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. And now you call the proud happy, looking at the proud, those that are unrighteous. And you say, well, they seem to be happy. And they that work wickedness, they're set up. Well, everything's working out for them. Listen, payday hasn't come for them yet. Yea, they that tempt God, they tempt God and are even delivered. He said, you think that they're, you think that they're being blessed? I had a preacher say to me one time, he said, I, about some things that had happened in his life. And he said, some people that seem to get away with, with things. And I tell you, this day, looking back, we know that they didn't get away with anything. And I said to him that day, he was kind of like, he was kind of like talking like they were here in Malachi. He said, so they, they're getting away with it. And I said, do you really think they're getting away with it? Do you really think they're getting away with it? I smartened him up really quick. <laughs> he told me so afterwards. Verse 16 says, they that feared the Lord. Those that respected and reverenced God spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Those that feared the Lord, those that God said, listen, my blessing is upon the people that fear the Lord and that love God. God's number one in their life, and they're talking about me. Back and forth about the Lord. Amen. 
Not about the church. Church isn't perfect, but talk about the Lord. Amen. Talk about what God is doing. Amen. He said, God said, I heard it. And I, I wrote it down in my diary. I got a book of remembrance. He said, it meant so much to me to see their reverence, their respect. I hearkened, I heard, and I wrote it down every time they talked about me. Every time they thought upon my name. Oh, I'll tell you what, when you get the heart of God, when you get through to the heart of God, when we live in reverence of the Lord, when we honor God with our lives, I'm telling you that you are going to get God's attention. Hallelujah. Verse 70, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord. Of hopes in the day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them. I will spare. You know that God will literally spare you from problems and situations that otherwise, you know, you might run hog wild into. You might run into situations. God will spare you. God will protect you. Amen. I think when we get to heaven and we're talking all over with Jesus. We're going to find out God did a whole lot more for us than what we ever realized. Because he spared us from so much. Amen. I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. So when God's number one, when you fear the Lord, when you respect the Lord, when, you talk, when you're when passionate about the Lord, when you want to talk to other people about Jesus. Amen. He said, I'm going to write it down. He said, and I will, I'll, I'll claim you as mine and I will spare you. He said in verse 18, then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked. He said, you will have the ability to discern things spiritually. Huh. Between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. I believe that this is something that God wants the church to move into. is a place of discernment. Oh, there has been such a lack in the past. of I'm talking spiritual discernment. Where we can know in the Holy Ghost what to watch out for. Amen. I'll tell you, when God starts moving, there'll be all kinds of things will come in. And not everybody, not, and, and the enemy will try to sow some tares. There'll be wheat and there'll be tares. How many know that's what Jesus said? He said, just leave them till the harvest. Just be kind, be sweet to everybody. But if, if there's a tear and God reveals, it's not for you to go around talking about. It. Don't tear them up. You leave it. Jesus said, uh, uh, the, the, the man said, well, should we go and dig them up and, uh, you know, get rid of the tares because they're taking up room in the field? He said, no, because he said, if you dig up the tares, he said, you may dig up the wheat. You'll destroy the wheat. You know, it's possible that, that a tear can be in a family. It's possible. And if, if sometimes God doesn't want us to deal with things. Some things can't be dealt with. If there's somebody who's got a, an attitude and, you know, and, and they're unsubmissive, you're just going to love them. Amen. Love them and pray that they're opposing themselves. The Bible says, be in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Let's prevent your God will give them repentance. Just love them. Don't try to straighten everybody out. Don't try to fix everything. Amen. Just pray about it. Amen. I pray people right out of the church. No, I don't think I have here. I don't think I have here. But honestly, I, I will tell you one prayer I do praise. God bring the hungry. I'm not interested in a bunch of critical people from another church just coming in here and bringing their criticism with them. I want hungry people that want Jesus. I want hungry people that want the word, that want to worship, that want to have revival, that want to love, that want to minister, that want to get ready for the, king, for the coming kingdom. That's what I pray. And I say, God, anything that's not going to add to the infrastructure, that's not going to make this church a better church, you say, well, what about their soul? That's their responsibility to get right with God. We can preach the message. We can exemplify the life. We can try to be the best Christian. But you know what? All you have is your influence. And if they don't follow the influence of the man of God, if they don't follow the teaching of the word of God, just leave them. Amen. Some people are going to help pay the bills. But let me tell you something. Not everybody that works at the airport is going to get on the flight. The rapture takes place. Not everybody in the airport is going to, get, going to take that last flight. But my, my objective is to be on that flight. Amen. But God can, God can use people to finance what he wants to do. Yes, he can. Amen. Hallelujah. Even Jesus had a Judas. He helped fulfill the plan of God, didn't he? There's an example right there of terror right amongst the wheat. But Jesus had discernment. He tried to help his disciples to be able to discern. Up to that point, they couldn't. But I'll tell you what, afterward, when, when uh, Philip goes down to Samaria and preaches in Acts chapter 8, 
And Simon believes and gets baptized. Philip doesn't pick up on it. He's in a new evangelist. He was just a grocery boy delivery not too long before that. So he's just new at the job. But when Peter come along and, and Simon said, give me power that I can pray for people to get the Holy Ghost like you are. He said, I'll give you money. I'll pay you. He said, your heart perish with you. He said, you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money? He said, your heart, I perceive you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. You're not right with God. He said, the judgment of God's going to, he said, oh, pray for me that none of these things will happen. And Peter could discern. And I'll tell you what, if you want to pray for your pastor, pray God give him discernment. Amen. Hallelujah. We've got a lot of precious children in this church. Amen. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you something. If there's anything I'm protective of, it's our children. Amen. And if there's anything that comes through those doors and it's not, if you know something, let me know. <laughs> you can come to me. I'm not going to broadcast it, but I want to know if there's, if there's a problem. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Amen. Because we don't want any devils working here. We want our we want this to be a safe place. Amen. And we will we will watch and we will be protective and we will be vigilant. But I know how the devil works. Amen. And we don't want we want holiness and deliverance in this place. We want people to come in. I'm not saying that somebody can't get saved and delivered. God can save them and deliver them. He can, but I want to tell you something. You'll know it. You'll know it when they're saved. You will know it. Is this all right? all right? That just brings something out of me. I'm very protective. I mean, I'm protective of our people too, not just the children. For behold, the day cometh and shall burn as an oven and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. If you haven't discovered yet by looking around, What's happening in the world? We are facing judgment from God. Amen. But unto you that fear my name. This is in the time of judgment. But God's going to deal with the proud. And the day comes that will burn as an oven. That you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Isn't that beautiful? And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. God says I will bring a move of Healing into the body of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. If you need healing, just lift your hand right now and just begin to praise God. There is a wave of healing power coming to the church. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. You shall tread down the wicked. Well, God's going to give us the upper hand. Amen. We're going to be a dominating force in this community. The powers of wickedness are being pulled down. For they shall be as ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Now, why does he mention this? This is just at the conclusion of the Old Testament. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. Let me tell you something. The only Bible the early church had for decades was the Old Testament. They didn't have, they didn't call it the Old Testament. It was just the Bible. It was just the Word of God. It wasn't that the first gospel was written in AD 60. That was approximately probably 30 years, 25, 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And a lot of the prison epistles Paul wrote from prison, obviously. Uh, they were prison epistles. The last book of the New Testament was written about 60 years after Jesus. The word of God is the word of God. Remember ye the law. You say, what about the ceremonial law? The ceremonial law was fulfilled in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But the moral laws of God do not change. Amen. He said, remember. He said, well, that's just talking about the Old Testament. Listen, let's read the last, next few verses. He's talking about the coming of the Lord. He's talking about our generation here. He said, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That was not the first coming. That's the second coming. Never look at your neighbors and that's the second coming. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. God is saying, 
that there is a powerful Elijah type of ministry coming to restore the church back to its place of power. And God is saying, I will deal with fathers, I believe that's natural fathers, but spiritual fathers, and relationships will be very, very important in the last day church. Just like it was in the book of Acts. Relationship is everything. Your relationship with God and your relationship with one another. Amen. I'm very, very protective of relationships. Amen. And God wants to bless. God wants to move in stupendous ways in these last days. But we got to do what Malachi says. We've got to be prepared. Let's stand together. Pastor's gone over. I just fired up tonight. Some nights I finish up. Well, that'll make up for, was it last week? I get done at 10 to. <laughs> and Ellen reminded me, well, you haven't finished the chapter. <laughs> well, we finished the book tonight. We finished the book tonight. Aren't you thankful for the word of God? Amen. Everybody say, I want to be ready. I want to be ready. Amen. I want to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight so much for your sweet presence, for coming and comforting and ministering to us and blessing us. And we just pray, send strength, send power, send victory into every life, every home, oh God. And let us have a great rest of the week, Lord. And coming back for the weekend, we pray for the blessing of the Lord. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen.